Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of the DCU Chapter 1 discussion series. And if you if you didn't know already, what we do here is we talk about everything and anything to do with the upcoming DCU projects, theories, speculations, it could be about individual projects from Superman Legacy, what should the suit look like, a theory behind a plot to lanterns or what the hell's going on there. But most recently, we've had some big news with that of Matt Reeves and his Arkham series now being in James Gunn's DCU. So a lot of the questions, not all of them, we will be dying around in some other projects as well, of course, but the first few questions will most certainly be surrounding the DCU Batman. What does this mean about the DCU Batman? How are they going to approach this Arkham show? And I wanted to say, if you couldn't tell already, a uh, Merry Christmas, but you know, my little ball here is getting trapped by the headset. That sounded kind of strange, my little ball, but you know, it's kind of getting stuck. But I did this last year, so I have to do it again. And the funny thing is, I, <laughs> I, I've planned videos like this one, but is this uploading around Christmas or is it after Christmas? I don't know, but either way, Merry Christmas. Thank you and shout out to all the DC, DCU fans, DC fans uh, for supporting me this year on the channel. Next year is going to be a big one ramping up to James Gunn's DCU with Superman Legacy. So we've got a good couple of years ahead of us. I've got high energy in today's video. Um, there's a lot to be talking about. It's probably going to be a long one. Like this video if you do go on to enjoy, of course, would really appreciate that as well. But let's get in to question number one. So this is from Austin Kimbriel 4811 saying, In a world where heroes, villains, and gods exist already, to me it makes so much more sense doing the Arkham show for the DCU. Building Batman's rogues, arguably the best in comics already existing, allows us to fully immerse in the world of Batman. This allows the brave and the bold to take off running and not have to shoehorn in introductions and backstories. We'd love to hear your thoughts. So yeah, I mean, I think we're going to talk a little bit later uh, with regards to if it's really going to be beforehand. Like, is it really going to be before Brave and the Bold or afterwards? But one thing I will say with this comment is that with the Arkham show and a lot of you guys are suggesting a certain way to approach that with regards to the rogues that I can't wait to get into, let's just say before diving fully into that, it is a way that you can flesh them out without, yeah, having to do Brave and the Bold and then whenever we do come across another Batman story or maybe even in the Brave and the Bold, have to set up all of these characters within actual Batman solo movies or, I don't know, collaboration movies. Obviously, we're starting off with the Brave and the Bold of Damian Wayne, so there could be a rogues gallery villain in that. I'd be surprised if there isn't. We've talked about that before with, you know, Bruce taking Damian out on the day in the life, or should I say night in the life, of Batman's duties in Gotham City, but obviously they're not going to necessarily set up all the villains in that movie. And as you say yourself, Austin, in a world where heroes, villains, and gods exist already. Exactly. I know some people are somewhat turned off by that idea in James Gunn's DCU, but I personally do really, really, really like it. Because I know in a weird way, the DCEU somewhat tried to do something like that. Technically, a world where heroes exist, like Batflick, but he was more of a myth. He wasn't so much of a known thing. Superman had only just come onto the scene. Again, Martian Manhunter only revealed himself properly in Zack Snyder's Justice League. So, so you get what I'm saying. The way Gunn's approaching it with the DCU in a world where heroes exist and have existed the same for all kinds of villains, metas, anti-heroes, God knows what, Justice Society, as you guys know, I kind of hopefully want a prequel announced at some point in time in the future. They exist. So the fact that we probably can have a good guess that Batman's been active for a good 10 to 12 years, if you want to say, yes, there's going to be some rogues that he's most certainly come up against, multiple by that point. I mean, geez. So it really does allow us this show. I know some people might not see the potential. I know a lot of you do. But I think if tackled correctly, it could really add this exposition that could do wonders for the for the Batman's world building. Now up next, and those of you who are here for like other questions regarding Superman Legacy, don't worry, we, we will get into it. It's just there's quite a bit of DCU Arkham slash Batman stuff to also get out the way. So this one is where we're now getting into how they could actually tackle it. And I have to tell you guys, I love this idea. As I already said, it's like, 
I, I, I don't see how they can't do it this way now. So Mikkel693A says, as a lot of comments are suggesting, and, and he's right, a lot of you posted this, so it must be going around with everyone agreeing that, my god, this is the way to do it. As a lot of comments are suggesting that the Almost Got Him episode of Batman the Animated Series could set the vibe for this show. Wouldn't it be awesome if the viewpoints of different characters mythologized Batman through their various accounts of run-ins with him? Their imaginations and fear could play a big part in how he is portrayed as more than human, a nearly supernatural creature of the night. This has big potential at showing how he is like an urban legend to most criminals, and then some of them might have an almost personal relationship with him and see him more for the man that he is. Love to hear your thoughts on this. So I absolutely love what people are saying here, and as Mikkel pointed out, uh, the Almost Got Him episode of Batman the Animated Series, in where essentially you have a, a few rogues from Penguin, Two-Face, Poison Ivy, the Joker himself, they're kind of hiding out at this club, they're like playing a card game, but all while this is happening, each one of them uh, to the Joker's kind of like, I suppose, jealousy because I don't think he wants to believe that any other rogues gallery villain could really get close enough to having actually almost got the Batman, right? So each one of them, as per the episode's title, tell the story of how they almost got him. But the brilliant thing about it was that it turned out to be a sting operation and Batman was actually <laughs> in disguise as Killer Croc at the location so he could uh, find out where Selina was being kept. It's, it's a fantastic episode and I see why people are recommending it with regards to now we know that the Arkham show is in the DCU and it's just the potential of the comparison to this episode is mind-blowing. I am so obsessed with it. The reason why I am is because the idea of that, which I'm sure many of you can tell, is that if you're going to do a DCU Arkham show, so this is canonically an Arkham show, it's canonically linked to the DCU Batman. If there's one thing that we know about Arkham is that it is full of rogues gallery villains, what else are you going to do other than explore the rogues gallery? Now I'm not dismissing that you can of course get into some other things, but that is the safest course of assuming things that we could probably go down. Now with the idea of course of the Batman animated series episode Almost Got Him, I don't necessarily think, which is why I chose the other comment, it would be straight up the episode where they're all playing cards around the table uh, and where within just one episode of the Arkham series they all you know, explain how they almost got him, or just some kind of experience. I mean, obviously, one thing I do want to get clear is that it wouldn't be a one-to-one -one adaptation of the Batman animated series episode, so it wouldn't necessarily be about Poison Ivy saying, oh, I almost got him with my little poisonous cloud of gas or whatever. It might be about them telling stories about their first encounter with Batman, or this, or that, or the other. I do think what you can do is take that idea, and obviously, it's going to be multiple episodes, so let's just say eight, or maybe it might be six, to be honest because that might be fitting for maybe not featuring every single rogues gallery member possible, but maybe the ones obviously that they choose. And that could be from popular characters to maybe lesser popular rogues gallery characters. And what you can still do is, to be honest, you can still do a similar thing and where they're in Arkham, maybe there's a bit of a card game, but that's assuming they're allowed out of their cells because don't forget a lot of these um, rogues gallery villains. So let's just say Killer Croc is one of them and let's just say it's not bad. Batman in disguise this time, which is uh, something I absolutely love about that episode and, and how he was sat in there the whole time and just listening to them always say about how they almost got him, right? But they, they have each cell, and I can imagine in the DCU is especially that they're going to really go for the thing and where because it's fantastical and you know they won't really hold back I imagine with Killer Croc it would be like intimidating ass Killer Croc not Suicide Squad level Killer Croc but maybe like Arkham Games level or like Poison Ivy their cells are catered to deal with who they are, so metahuman dampeners, or the killer croc, a type of cell in where he can't really barge out of, etc, etc. So I don't know if they're going to have the luxury to necessarily hang out with one another, so maybe you might have a situation where you have a worker at Arkham listening to, or maybe a doctor who makes the rounds per rogues gallery character, and they tell their story of how they ended up in here. And that would of course be a story about the Batman in the DCU. So I think that would be a way of like doing a version of Almost Got Him. But this is where, and there's quite a few questions of people asking me this, so I don't want to necessarily show a bunch of screenshots, but that would assumingly show the character of Batman 
in these episodes. So that is something that's pretty crazy to imagine, Batman in a TV series. But if there's one thing that we do know about the DCU is that James Gunn said their DCU actors will be cohesively, well, consistent across the project. So the like David Cornsweet as Superman, if he, in the story, and if it's warranted, the character of Superman, let's just say, appears or needs to appear in Lanterns, like the show, or any TV series for that matter, just for example's sake, that would be David Corrinsweet. So the idea of Batman appearing in the Arkham series, which is a canonical DCU show, for the first time in a long time, and where I've heard many people say for many years, oh, a, a Batman, you know, TV show, a DC TV show, I'm just like, mm, they're not really going to do that. But for the first time, now we know the new rule set of this cohesive DC universe across movies, TV shows, video games, and animation, that is actually doable. So with regards to comments like this from Begsy saying, I would love for the show to build up not just to the backstory of Batman, but the whole Bat family before we see them. Maybe have an episode dedicated to a villain that each Bat family member took down. So kind of what we've been saying there, but we haven't really spoken about how they can explore other Bat family members being involved. But let's just, let's just do that right now. Yeah, you would have to think that if each villain even in a similar way, if we want to somewhat mirror Almost Got Him. And the idea here from Begsy is that we could see, let's just say Dick Grayson is Nightwing in The Brave and the Bold, which would really make, obviously, a lot of sense if, you know, as we know, Damian Wayne is coming in at the time of the movie. Well, you could still see maybe flashbacks at least maybe as of like a few years ago, or maybe one of the villains was put away more recently. But let's just say one of the villains has been locked up there for like four or five years. So that would go back to Dick Grayson's time as Robin. There could be some flashbacks of seeing Batman drop in and Robin and maybe even Batgirl. Because if you've watched my uh, theories on that, I've said that at 28, Bruce could train Dick Grayson for six years, and within those six years, Barbara Gordon also comes on board as Batgirl. You could honestly see something like that. Now, I'm not saying Batman would be like insanely heavily featured, and I'm also not saying on the opposite end that he would just be like what shows have done up until now, if we ever rarely did see Batman in Titans, or even at the end of Gotham, he was just like a shadowy figure. Granted that Gotham actually did show him in like the final shot, but you know what I mean. Other than that, normally it's like a flap of the cape. I think we would get better than that. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a weird thing to imagine because technically, as per James Gunn's words, there isn't really a restriction on seeing DCU characters across any medium that is canonical. This is the most important line to say that is canonical across the DCU project. So it doesn't matter if it's a movie or a TV show or animation. If that character is going to be or is warranted to be in any of those stories, no matter what the medium is, even a video game, that same damn actor will be voicing it or appearing in it like acting in it so yeah maybe it will uh you know contain some cool stories of you know let's just say killer croc got put away by batman and robin when dick grayson was robin maybe poison ivy only got put away one year three months ago so at this time maybe batman was solo and he hadn't quite found jason todd yet or maybe jason was there like there's so much potential that i don't want to get too carried away with because mentioning jason todd right off the top of my head i've said that my preference would be for jason todd to have not have returned as the red hood yet or be a part of the bat family because I think in the time of the Brave and the Bold with Damian Wayne coming in, it would be pretty cool if they still think Jason is dead because this could save another story slash movie idea for some time down the future in the DCU for an Under the Red Hood type story. But my point is, if you're still following me here, maybe one of the villain's uh, stories that we see in the Arkham show recollects a time of when they got put away or when they first encountered Batman when Jason Todd was still working with Batman before he died. As much as this series, the discussion series on the channel is about speculation, I don't want to go too overboard there, but at the base level, we've set some things up here that would be quite likely in my opinion. We can't rule out Batman himself appearing. And also the thing is with regards to what Begsy said here, I would love for the show to build up not just to the backstory of Batman, but you know, some other things. That can still be done even if the Arkham show doesn't, let's just say, come out before The Brave and the Bold. Because The Brave and the Bold is tackling quite a specific story. I know it's gonna have its own unique kind of exposition for Batman's 
you know, world and how far he's got in there. You know, like how Superman Legacy is obviously uh, a Superman movie, but it's going to be a lot of things that it's like, okay, this is what the new DCU looks like from, you know, Superman's perspective, Metropolis. Brave and the Bold's going to do a similar thing with us, literally launching into a Batman. He's already been active for some time, still pretty much in his prime, but not too old as well. But it can still only tackle so many things. So my only point here is that the Arkham series can still come out after the Brave and the Bold and then flesh out you know, whatever they're going to do. Let's just say almost got him like rogues gallery stories where we just visit even more of the Batman after the Brave and the Bold that just, you know, we only saw so much in the Brave and the Bold movie. But if you're wondering about other characters that he's been putting away, well, that can get fleshed out in that series. So that is possible. And I know some people after hearing that might be like, but I really think maybe it should come out before the Brave and the Bold. My take of this is it's just way too hard to know. You know, if I look at it logically, it's quite hard to know when the Brave and the Bold is going to come out because who knows what could maybe be reshuffled or, you know, prioritized in the DCU Chapter 1 Project's order that was said in the Gods and Monsters video. Like, you know, for example, Wolf might not come out until after Superman Legacy, even though it was revealed in the order to be before Superman Legacy. So is Brave and Bold coming out 2026? If so, then maybe you could get the Arkham show filmed and done before then to maybe release in the back half of 2025, maybe the first half of 2026, and then the Brave and the Bold comes out like, you know, summer or fall 2026. So, you know, there is enough time to like produce that and make it happen, especially when it's been pitched already right now and apparently has a writer. It depends if that writer is still attached, but you get my point. Uh, it is technically feasible and logistical to get it done before then, but I don't want to set expectations in people's minds to be like, oh, this is definitely coming out and building up to the DCU's Batman before the Brave and the Bold. So we already have this, you know, vibe of him before we get in there. I, I can't, I, I definitely don't recommend looking at it that way, but you never know. They, they could take that approach. But should we really see the Batman or the Batman of the DCU in a DCU series slash TV show before his own movie? Now, again, this kind of comes back to what I was saying a, a couple of minutes ago. Technically, that shouldn't be something I'm even really bringing up because... According to James Gunn, you know, technically the DCU TV shows, since they're linked canonically to the movies, they're both really just as important as each other. So there's no discriminating really against, oh, you know, you can't have this Batman appear in a TV show because he's reserved for movies kind of thing. They're, they're literally in the same world. So yeah, I mean, Batman can appear in the show before the movie. But will, will they do that though? Like, I, I don't know why they might not because they're in the same world, but maybe they just would rather feature Batman in his own, like, premiered kind of appearance of a movie, kind of for the same reasons as to why I'm sure David Corrin sweat Superman, they rather reserve his first appearance for his own Superman movie versus that of shoving some early DCU series out there and just having David Corrin sweat Superman appear in that. I wouldn't discount a little appearance at the very least, maybe like Batman just attending Arkham. For all we know, actually, a cool way to do it would be Batman, you know, like at the beginning of Arkham Asylum, where the Arkham doors open up after Batman drove up there with his Batmobile and he dropped um, the Joker off there. He could be dropping off the latest Rogues Gallery villain and then the rest of the series follows the Doctor going from inmate cell to inmate cell the Batman almost got him type vibe but the most we saw of Batman really and this would be our actual first DC Batman appearance would be at the beginning and they'd make it kick ass but brief. He rocks up Batmobile parked, escorts, insert Rogues Gallery villain here at the beginning of the show and everyone's like, oh, this is sick. But the show itself, the substance, the episodes is more about the rogues and their, you know, recounting of the stories. But then we don't see, you know, the DC Batman again properly until the brave and the bold but at least that way you know we kind of got the best of both worlds they kind of teased us with batman like the beginning of the arkham asylum game but then the meat of the show of course is titled arkham so then they kind of go head over heels into that but then again i can understand when someone might say yeah i think that's cool but i still think maybe they should reserve the batman's first appearance of the dcu for his own movie because it's a bit more of a prestigious premiere. I don't know. Which then just kind of makes me go back to the idea of it might make more sense for the DCU Brave and the Bold movie to come out, right? You're, you're more exploring the Damian Wayne relationship there with his father. You've got the Bat family in it to some extent. You'll probably have Nightwing, Son of Batman mode in a way. You probably have a night in the life of Batman situation where he takes Damian out there. You might even encounter a rogues gallery villain. 
But for the Arkham series, yeah, that comes afterwards, and you can still follow what I said. Like then, since we've already seen Batman before, you're not introducing him for the first time when you do that kind of Arkham Asylum video game intro when he rocks up, tosses somebody, a rogues gallery villain in Arkham, and then the series proceeds to kind of go on with almost got him like episodes. But at least then it wouldn't be the first time you've seen him. It would just be cool to have seen him again in the very first episode's 10 minutes, introducing the series by tossing in another rogues gallery character. And then, yeah, the show's episodes unfold accordingly. So I've been rambling for absolutely forever about that. Let me know your own thoughts, because there's a lot to play with. Now, Aaron Cortez says here, and I feel the exact same way, knowing that Matt Reeves is going to be part of the Arkham show gives me even more hope that the DCU Batman world will be a terrifying yet awesome world. Definitely what I hope will be. I couldn't agree more. Um, that's one thing I've been saying as well, and I know a lot of people have got it twisted, and, and for those of you who don't know, by the way, we're getting, obviously, as this is a uh, DCU discussion series video, into the Arkham, like the DCU Batman Arkham version, but in my The Batman discussion series that's either already out or it's coming out after this, we get into quite heavily what would have been with Arkham, what this means now for the Batman universe with Joker, considering a lot of us thought that Joker would have been in the Bat versus version of the Arkham show. So do check that video out if it's already up. Let's just say there's a lot of Arkham talk within both universes at the minute, within both videos. But the reason why I bring that up is because a lot of people seem to think that it's weird for Matt Reeves to be doing his own Batverse, as well as being involved in a DCU, when it really, really isn't. Don't forget that Matt Reeves is going to be so, 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 so busy with the Batman part two and part three and, you know, technically the Penguin show, but that's still being left to a lot of other people. Don't forget that Matt Reeves isn't directing or really writing the Penguin show. He is very much so creatively involved, but he's also doing other things alongside his very busy schedule writing the Batman part two and everything that he'll be doing in pre-production eventually. We have also things like producing Batman Cape Crusader, producing is very much so creatively involved in the process, obviously, in helping curate that project. And what James Gunn has done is he's also going to let him produce on future DCU shows. Not just Arkham, he also meant other shows as well, which is going to be interesting. Matt Reeves can produce shows in the DCU as well as do his Batman thing in the Batverse, keeping it very, very, very separate. Because producing, all while, you know, I'm not saying a producer's work is light, it isn't the same as being writer and director of your own project, like, properly. So Matt Reeves can be this producer for the DCU, and of which a lot of us are thinking, the DCU Batman. As Aaron says here, which made me talk about all of this, it gives him hope that the DCU Batman world will be a terrifying yet awesome world. Yeah, Matt Reeves can most certainly produce, help produce the DCU Batman. What I like to say, this consultant, help make sure that the DCU Batman and the world that is fleshing out and building up this Batman, so namely here with the Arkham show, is done correctly, done right. And I think James Gunn is aware that Matt Reeves is a really good Batman consultant because sure, even if you don't like, because some people don't on this channel, like the Batman that much, whether you found it boring this, that and the other, or you don't care about grounded, you want more fantastical. Well, that's the thing. He can keep his grounded Batman within the Batverse. We all love that. I especially do, but he can also add his very good understanding of Batman, but equip that with what his lens of the fantastical would be at the same time. So if you love Matt Reeves and are wondering, oh shit, what would what would Matt Reeves be like handling fantastical Batman, or at least consulting on the DC Batman that way? And maybe you get the best of both worlds there. I mean, exactly. I imagine where things will go with that. So I do think with Matt Reeves's touch and um just overall feeling and instinct with Batman is going to be absolutely insane for the DCU Batman and only a good thing. When I say insane, I mean like insanely fantastic. All right, so to take a little bit of a break from the Arkham series questions, but this is still related to Matt Reeves on his future DCU produced projects, maybe. So George says something that I have been wanting but didn't also know that I wanted at the same time so I'll explain what I mean so George uh, W1014 says if Matt Reeves starts doing non-Batman related DCU projects I'd love to see him handle the question who I really want to see at some point in the DCU right so 
If you've seen my video, go check it out if you haven't. It was titled something like 10 shows that I want to see be announced uh, in the DCU. One of them was absolutely the question. I even laid down some low-key evidence of how James Gunn has literally liked tweets saying, if James Gunn adds the question to the DC universe or something, I'm gonna go crazy. I'll probably show the screenshot right now. Um, and it was like a remarkably kind of good indication that he might be like, look, I've announced 10 projects for DCU Chapter 1 so far. I've already said that is less than half of the projects yet to be announced just to complete Chapter 1, not including Chapter 2. Maybe one of those projects could be a question project. Now, the reason why I've said it's something I've wanted yet, this is also something I didn't know I wanted at the same time, was with regards to Matt Reeves. Because when I said... And this whole time I've said I want a question DCU show. I obviously, it was never really in my mind that Matt Reeves would be producing DCU shows because he's quite busy with his Batverse. But, you know, one thing we know is that obviously he pitched the Arkham show to be a DCU show. James Gunn said he's going to also be helping out with uh, producing other DCU series. Matt Reeves producing future DCU projects of which we have no idea what they'll be at this time might not just be limited to DCU Batman stuff. Because don't get me wrong, as I've stated already, I think he will be based basically producing DCU Batman, be the biggest consultant they have, in addition to whatever James Gunn, you know, wants, because he's the curator, the Feige, if you will, of the DCU, so it ultimately he has the final say. So there's going to be Arkham, DCU Batman, Brave and the Bold, I'm sure Matt Reeves will have some producing capacity in that. But of course, don't rule out other characters. And if there's one character that suits Matt Reeves, that is the question. Because that I've already imagined like a DCU uh, video game surrounding the question. If you guys remember, one of Rockstar's games that didn't really take off as well as, um, you know, GTA did is L.A. Noir. In that game, you're literally a detective. Some of the game mechanics literally include you trying to interview, um, you know, uh, suspects or witnesses and call them out and they're lying. And I can really imagine the question of which you know <laughs> he's very 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 detective based doing that with Matt Reeves's input making and bringing his best aspects of a point of view driven noir thing that he does with Batman that seems like a perfect fit to me and guess what bookmark it right now I'm not saying that will happen but I've got a good feeling that if uh, if the question comes to the DCU of which through James Gunn's teases Sure, you could say, oh, he was just entertaining it, but like, I I've got a good feeling about the, the tweet that he liked, um, that Matt Reeves will have something to do with it, in, in, in my guess. If I, was to lay if I was a betting man, I would be like, you know what? I think it will at least say that Matt Reeves is producing that one. But I could be wrong. So, yeah, if you guys know who the question is, you already know, but it would be right up Matt Reeves' alley. And uh, I would love to know what you think of that. And also let me know what other characters you would like Matt Reeves to kind of help produce in the DCU and what notes he could have and what kind of creative influence he could also bring to that character while not necessarily and obviously directing and writing it himself. He'd kind of most likely just be in a role of a producer. So up next, we have the usurper saying, I have a few questions for the discussion series, but they're pretty generic. So apologies if you get asked this stuff. A lot. Boba. Out of all of the DC characters who are yet to have a confirmed appearance in the DCU, who would you most want to be introduced? Is there a particular story you'd want to be used as their introduction? Also, is there an actor you have in mind for this role? Personally, I really want to see Green Arrow done justice. Most general audience and non-comic fans think of him as just a Batman who uses bows, but he's so much more than that. Well, the thing is, I don't. I guess you haven't seen me say this before, but um, for me, it probably is also... Oliver Queen, the Green Arrow as well, because in my, uh, again, referring to my top 10 uh, characters or shows that I want to see announced in the DCU, right towards the top, and it might even be number one, I think it was number one, was the Green Arrow. And I say that because, of course, there are other characters I really want as well. I really want to see John Constantine, like the kind of magical dark side of the DCU start to unfold. I'm not saying we need to rush into that. We are getting swamp things, so who knows where that could eventually 
actually go. Now, as for the story, you know what? I, I'm really not sure right away with Oliver Queen because Batman is going to be at least 10 years into his career, right? Um, with where he's at, already having Bat family members, already having a son now come in. So at the very best, you know, if you wanted to make it at his earliest, reasonably earliest, I've always said 36. Now, you can change a bit of chronological canon there, maybe train Dick Grayson for a little bit less amount of time, maybe skip over a Robin or whatever to maybe make him 34, similar to more Superman's age. But for Oliver Queen, I don't think I need him to be like, hey, yeah, he's been going around for 10 years. But if you did want him to be going around for a while, you know, I would like it to refer to his origins on the island, maybe exaggerate how long he's been there, really. Or maybe in the DCU, maybe, you know what, make it an origin movie. Maybe make it big news that Oliver Queen, who was presumed dead, has only just returned to Star City. That is something I, I, I'm so, I, I really want the Green Arrow because what you said there is exactly my theory for what I've said for the longest time as to why Green Arrow hasn't gone beyond Arrow, the show on the CW. It's because I think from a business perspective, and I could be totally off here, but I think optics wise, what do you see there? And I agree, he is so much more than Batman with a bow and arrow. I mean, he's a literally a completely different character, personality and everything like that. But maybe, you know, when you have like market research and stuff, they've maybe thought before that if we were to bring, hey, who's this guy? He's a vigilante, right? He also has inherited a massive wealthy company and he's a billionaire kind of playboy, situ you know, People in the public side who aren't familiar with the characters you pointed out might think, oh, how's this guy really any different to Batman? I mean, other than the bow and arrow. So maybe that's why you haven't had them both in the universe at the same time. I mean, at least early on in the, in the DC, or at least why Oliver Queen wasn't a priority when they built up Batfleck or something. Because, you know, you could always argue after Man is Still, Batman versus Superman, you know, you've got Aquaman and everything like that. They, they could have done a Green Arrow movie if they wanted to, I'm just saying. But they probably thought thought at the time, and this is just my own like conspiracy here. I mean, I, I don't know at the end of the day, but maybe it is just because and eh, we've already got a vigilante. But in this DCU where you already have like, oh, look at all these superheroes, you know, granted that they have different powers, you could say the same thing there. It's like, oh, this hero is similar to that. So I really do hope that James Gunn, and one thing we do know about him is that he's a huge Green Arrow fan. So I, I think there is a likelihood that Oliver Queen could very well happen. And all you need to do is just make him distinct. I already think he is quite distinct with obviously his uh, choice of weaponry, his personality being a bit of it. Well, not just a bit, but way more quippy than Batman. Maybe instead of having Oliver 10 years into his career, that's why, as I've already said, a way to kind of make that different would be an origin for Oliver Queen and where he's come back to Star City. They've recovered him after going missing for all of that time. Even though I believe, if I remember correctly in the comics, it was a much shorter amount of time. I think most recently was it only like one year. Uh, but I think it would be way more dramatic if Oliver went missing um, for like, let's just say even beyond five years, six years, seven years. But either way, guys, I am desperate for Oliver Queen to come to the screen. I think that would be absolutely fantastic. They just need to make him different. I do think that is most certainly achievable. I think the potential for it is remarkable. Even though actually most recently, apparently Charlie Hunnam was indeed approached with a Green Arrow pitch. And I think even though he didn't name who it was, he just said it was Suits. I have to assume it was Michael DeLuca and Pamela Abdi from Warner Brothers whenever he was presented it. Um, it. It clearly shows that they were looking into it. But the thing is, maybe around that time, Batman in the DCEU wasn't so much a front and center thing because as we know, even though Batflick was interested in appearing in cameos and he did in The Flash and was down for Aquaman and even did, but that got cut out, uh, maybe they felt more comfortable because he wasn't as prominent. But in the DCU, you are, I'm, I'm guessing, going to have a fairly prominent Batman uh, after Brave and the Bold. So yeah, we're just gonna have to wait and see. But after a long ramble here, I'm desperate, desperate for Oliver Queen. Other than that, John Constantine. But if I had to pick right now and press like a big red button, say like initiate, I'd be like, yeah, kickstart the freaking DCU. Green Arrow.
project. Let's go. Now here from Austin Daniels, he says, I believe Lanterns will be the first series after Superman Legacy. It sounds like they have writers attached to the project, so am I wrong for being under the impression casting for Hal and John should start up pretty soon, if not already? Man, I, I can't wait for San Diego Comic Con next July. James is going to come in swinging. We'll probably get a lot of casting there unless it leaks sooner. What we have is Creature Commandos in 2024. Waller, I, I guess it will still come out in 2025. It just might not come out. Actually, yeah, it might not come out before Superman Legacy because that's a summer release in 2025. So Waller could technically come out in the fall of 2025. So that might be the first DCU series after Superman Legacy. But I do think ultimately it will be closely followed up with Lanterns because I believe Peter Safran did say that they were aiming for two DCU TV shows and two DCU movies a year. But either way, let's just call it Lanterns is roughly aiming for a full 2025 release date. I don't think that would mean that Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart would be announced uh, or being looked at being cast like anytime soon right now. Uh, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of look into that and we wouldn't get an announcement. And this is, by the way, absolutely rough speculation. I'm trying to think of this as I go along. Um, towards the after the summer of 2024, because I mean, I think they would be looking around that time. But if the show assumingly isn't coming out until after Superman Legacy, after the summer of 2025, let's just say November it releases, then, you know, you, you don't need to choose the actors right now. I mean, I get how long it kind of takes in the process. You've got to write it, you get into pre-production, but uh, even when they're writing it, and let's just say they're doing that soon. And of course, all of these projects are being developed. James Gunn says that they're all cooking away in the background. He said he's very excited about it. That doesn't mean they need to look for actors right now. Now, I wouldn't necessarily uh, get rid of the idea that they're making kind of um, front runner lists of who they would ideally kind of go for. But you do they don't need to start stressing about that with a casting director until sometime next year, I imagine, to ramp up for the production date, which, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they could do it a little bit before the summer and then start filming by summer and hoping to have it done by the end of the year, if not by the early 2025. So you have a, a lot of months for post-production to get that series ready to go and stream on max by the fall. But that's roughly when I kind of imagine the window of release will be, you know, sometime late 2025. I mean, I think we can all agree that it will be coming after Superman Legacy. We know Superman Legacy is coming out in the summer. So therefore, Lanterns, a fall-ish release. I mean, you know, maybe Wall is going to be in there as well. So that's something to bear in mind. Maybe Lanterns might come out a little bit after that. I hope not. But, you know, because I would like to see Lanterns after Superman Legacy quite sharply. But that's me just selfishly saying that. So yeah, now going back to the DCU Arkham series, here we have from Brutal Vengeance himself. Pretty simple question here. But do you think we'll get the chance to see the DCU's Joker in the Arkham show? Because Joker, by this time in Bruce's career, he's basically the king of Arkham Asylum. So in my opinion, it's a high possibility we'll see him. But again, they might take a backseat of showing another Joker. That is my stance, right? The latter of what you said is most certainly something I'm thinking about. Truly, will Joker be in the Arkham series? Because you can still do a, the Almost Got Him type adaptation without necessarily the Clown Prince of Crime. You know, they could easily make more than enough interesting episodes surrounding Poison Ivy's experience, Mr. Freeze, to any fantastical villain if you want it. It's, it's, it you know, guys, I already bawled over the potential earlier. But Joker is something I'm just like, man, I really, really don't know the answer to that question. And right now is truly a live reaction of the top of my head thinking about it because I'm just like in one way, yes, they could, right? You could already have Joker in Arkham. He can be, you know, molded in a similar way to what we were going over earlier, one of the stories, maybe one of the most anticipated episodes that fans might have. Maybe they have it as the finale uh, out of all the other rogue stories that we heard so far from the psychiatrist going around to sell to sell. This is the one out of the leaked episode name list that people have been waiting for. But then you have to think about the optics. Now, I'm not saying there's any limitation on Joker, especially in the DCU. Normally, you know, in the olden days, I say the olden days, but uh, there's there was 100% uh, 
apprehension of diluting the brand in where I know for a fact after speaking to insiders on shows sometimes and this has actually been um, you know public knowledge as well even showrunners have said it like even on Titans they were only allowed to use Lex Luthor if I remember correctly for two episodes now they can do what they wanted within reason within those two episodes but that's it now Joker on Gotham up until a much more you know final sign off in the final episode because they're kind of like look you it's, it's, it's the finale. So yeah, you can use Batman. You can kind of basically say, without saying Joker, that he's Jay. Do you know what I mean? In the final episode of Gotham. But before that, Jerome, Jeremiah, they completely had to always just play with the ideology of the Joker without them really kind of being the Joker. But now this is the DCU. So the Joker be, can be played with as much as James Gunn really sees fit. But I do th still think, even though it's not like the olden days with like how, oh, you might only be able to use Joker here or only in like a mainline movie. Within the Arkham series, I do think there's a little tidge bit of we need to kind of review the status of the character. Not that he's not a popular character, but how should we use him? Because we, we want to make sure that when we use him, it's done really effectively. Now, Joker, I mean, Jesus, this is the DCU Batman. Like, this is the mainstream you know i think the batman as we know on this channel is always going to be madly popular but ultimately it's an elseworlds project there's not a doubt in my mind that you know um as james gunn said the batman university's elseworlds projects aren't being treated like a stepchild they're prioritized just as much but at the same time i do still think of the dcu is still aimed to be the mainstream universe but i wanted to preface this with all of that by saying that they still have to take into account that you know you've had joker 2 now obviously by the time of this arkham series the brave and the bold whether the arkham series comes out before or after that's something that is fluid in this conversation right now but you've had joaquin phoenix relatively recently within the grand scheme of years right recent years then with the batman part two we don't know the true extent of barry keown's role in part two or the batman part three and if you're more interested in my thoughts specifically with regards to the arkham show now being in the dcu and how that impacts the batman as i said uh one of my christmas videos is a brand new the batman discussion series but what i'm trying to say here is they still need to take into account ultimately you've got barry keown's joker in the batman movies so should they really go ham with Joker, um, even if just for like some kind of appearance in this show? Maybe, like, I'm, I wouldn't rule it out, but I also just, it's, it's a weird situation of where I wouldn't be remotely surprised if they allude to him, but he's not heavily featured. And I wouldn't be remotely surprised if they did want to use him to quite a large or reasonable role. So will we see Joker in Arkham? I don't know, man. I really don't know. I know it's a bit of a cop-out answer, but they could easily say that Joker's out there in, in Gotham. He's not one of the villains currently in Arkham. He's currently laying low, and that could be a storyline reserved for the future. But at the same time, he could be in the maximum security wing, and they might be saving that kind of episode until the final episode. It's really, really hard to answer it. And I know for some of you, might it might be like, oh, it's obvious. They're, they're definitely going to capitalize on that character. But you know, without my fan goggles on, I would love to say that as well. But I do think they they will think about it strategically. Like, how much should we pour into this show with certain characters? Should we pour in the most popular character? Should we really go head over heels into an Arkham series episode? As I said, each episode could be per Rogue's Gallery retelling their story. Should we really go head over heels into Joker doing that? Or should we reserve him for a future role in one of the movies for, for more of a prestigious premiere of this DCU version of the character? And the thing is, I can imagine, maybe I'm overthinking it, and they would just be like, yep, Joker's in Arkham. They do an awesome reveal with an awesome, hopefully awesome actor. And he is, you know, just as, you know, jokery in everything that we want him to be. And he's just involved in such a way that complements the series. Chef's kiss beautifully. It's, I would love to, I turn the question around on you guys. Because for now... That's something that is just, um, you know, Joker obviously is one of the diamond Batman rogues gallery characters. So I, I'm a bit more like apprehensive as a result, especially with everyone saying Joker fatigue. And, you know, one thing, even though I disagree with that, he has been used quite a bit in the grand scheme of things. So we'll have to wait and see. Now up next here from this user, OUFH4899, I'm sorry for butchering the name. <laughs> well, 
Do you agree with the idea of James Gunn will surprise everybody with Robert Pattinson being the Batman of the DCU? So that means the first movie in the DCU is the Batman 2022. I hope that he'll fix the confusion of the two Batmans at the same time by adding Robert in the DCU. It will be great. And the Purple Hood here asks, would that mean Robert Pattinson is DCU Batman? Well, guys, in the words of Matt Reeves himself. Interesting. Um, no. <laughs> and lastly, everyone, for this episode of the DCU discussion series, we're going off. We're ending with a fat one. We're ending with a fat one from Mr. Movie Mafia. And as you can tell, my goodness. But he says, what I'm most looking forward to is each project feeling distinct. Gunn himself said that he wants people to be able to watch whatever film and show they want without being beholden to the rest of the DCU. If people want to watch Superman Legacy or Peacemaker Season 2 or Creature Commandos, they'll be able to enjoy and understand it without having to watch four other things. That's a problem the MCU has run into recently. Like, you wouldn't get the full impact of Doctor Strange 2 if you didn't watch WandaVision, for which you have to have seen Endgame and Infinity War, for which you have to have seen Doctor Strange 1 and the rest of the MCU and to the extent of what if in humans, X-Men movies and cartoon etc. I think getting away from that would be a nice change of pace and make it way more accessible for new audiences to jump on board with whatever project speaks to them the most, whether it be Superman, Lanterns, Blue Beetle, Booster Gold, Supergirl, Batman, Brave and the Bold, whatever. I'm really excited for people to like DC again and I think this will help. I completely agree there, just to interject. I do agree. And I'm not so sure everyone is truly aware of that. And and I, I think people like us do because we've really absorbed... Like, and Gunn's put out a lot of comments from the inception of joining the DCU, even in, you know, uh, major trade articles, really going over how comprehensive, consistent this DCU will be, how it will put character and story first. The DCU projects will be connected, but at the same time, tonally distinct. You didn't have the comics all share the same tone between that of a Batman comic and like a Swamp Thing comic or a Superman comic to that of even the tone of a Wonder Woman comic. So the movies will reflect that. And, it, you know, a lot of people say DC should go back to the days of, you know, where it's strongest just making Elseworlds movies. Like, you know, when they brought out the Nolan trilogy or when they brought out this DC film or whatever. And then they jump to the example of see how they've done with the Elseworlds movie. Look how well Joker did. Look how well the Batman did. So they should just do that no connected universe. But the thing is, funnily enough... What James Gunn is doing is a bit of a hybrid. What Mr. Movie Mafia is saying here, and just kind of like unlike the MCU, it will have a connected cohesion across all projects, all mediums from animated movies, video games, TV shows and everything. But like, for example, uh, James Mangold has talked about Swamp Thing. He says, all oh, while well, he's very, um, he, he, he very much so understands that Warner Brothers and DC view this as a part of this larger universe. He's not going into it thinking that. He's even detailed his rough approach to the story and where Swamp Thing, the movie in the DCU, is going to pick up with Swamp Thing already being Swamp Thing, but kind of horrified as to like, who am I? How did I become this, this creature, this Swamp Thing? And so he's, throughout the course of the movie... It's almost like a video game where, you know, or like if any of you have played Jedi Fallen Order, where you kind of go to different points of the levels and you get your force training back. You've already been trained in the ways of the force as a Padawan, but throughout the game, you kind of get your memory back, even though you already have the memory, if you know what I mean. So basically, Swampy is going to be going throughout the movie, recovering how he got to where he, he got. But that's going to be basically... A very kind of horror yet, uh, you know, character study of who and what makes Swamp Thing Swamp Thing. It's, it's going head over heels in Swamp Thing. And all while it is connected to the DCU and James Gunn said, will connect to other stories. And he's even referred to Rocket Raccoon and Thor in the MCU. And he wants to one up that with Swamp Thing. So imagining Swamp Thing with that of another DCU character. Now that might not happen anytime soon. But they are fundamentally with my point here and Mr. Movie Mafia's point here. Doing the hybrid approach of, you know, it's just all about this project. And eventually down the line, when it warrants it, you know, we'll, we'll connect it. But and, and some other projects will have more connected tissue initially than others. For example, the authority will most likely have 
a lot of connective tissue to Superman Legacy. After all, you've got the engineer and authority member in Superman Legacy, but some projects will get their time, like Swamp Thing probably, you know, collaborating with, I don't know who in the DCU, but someone. But initially he will have, you know, we're prioritizing the art of this project to make it a good movie about this character. Does that make sense? Well, I think that is amazing. And uh, I think that is truly what's going to make the future DCU movies, hopefully, if and when as of we, when we get there, really distinct and uh, break the mold of what has become repetitive with the current formula of comic book films. And you know what that is. Not saying it's the same for every last movie, but more or less c carrying on the same consistent tone, the same formula, the same feel, the same spectacle, not favoring character as much. But then lo and behold, what happens when you get Logan? What happens when you get the Batman? What happens when you get Joker? I'm not saying you think they're amazing movies, but the box office clearly shows a correlation between what the audience is paying money for, what they're hungry for, and that isn't that comic book movies are dying, it's the bloody repetition of the way comic book movies are approached in these universes. And say what you will, I can't guarantee if this DCU will be great or not, but at least Gunn identifies what is missing in the equation or what has got old in the equation, if you will. And hopefully that will be remedied with these future projects. Now, Mr. Movie Mafia goes on to say, my biggest concern was that it might not be a full reboot, but this is lessening as time goes on. Before, it seemed like the rebootiness of the DCEU to the DCU would be a 65-35 split with Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Shazam, The Suicide Squad, The Flash, and Team Peacemaker being brought over. But now, it seems like Gal Gadot isn't staying as Wonder Woman. Shazam 2 not doing so well means Levi could be out. Although he's not as big of a deal, so if he comes back, it wouldn't be the worst. People's lack of interest in Aquaman 2 seems like if Momoa comes back, it would be as Lobo, which would be a perfect compromise and keep him around for the audiences in a better way. Team Peacemaker is confirmed to return, as is Davis as Waller. But they're pretty minor characters, and apart from the cameos at the end of Season 1, feel separate enough that I can imagine them blending in. Those cameos do really mess with things with Flash and Aquaman, and that's the only sign I have that they'd actually stick around. But I imagine it will be like what Shazam 2 did, where we see flashbacks to the first movie, but with changes to show that the new reality is largely the same, but slightly different. I don't know, we'll see about these projects, but the totally new ones have me very excited. Completely agree, man. On a technicality, you could say that this is still a soft reboot, but it is primarily a hard reboot. Now, the technicality being, quite literally, if you want to say, on paper, a hard reboot means, theoretically, that Superman, if, you, if you're going to do a new universe with him, to, you know, any character from Amanda Waller needs a new actor. Not only new continuity, but a new actor, then this would categorize this not technically as a hard reboot. But as you say yourself, I always kind of still treat it like a hard reboot because at the end of the day, yeah, basically all the Justice League are being recast. You know, it's not like David Corrin Sweat's Superman is carrying on the continuity of Henry Cavill's Superman. It's completely brand spanking new along with the brand spanking new actor. And yes, the actors who are continuing on, like John Cena as Peacemaker, Freddie Stromer as you know, Vigilante, uh, Steve Agee as John Economos, etc., etc. They are so minor that as much as some people complain about it, I don't think that will confuse the general audience. I do get what you're saying, because in the early days, you couldn't rule out for an absolute certainty that Wonder Woman and, you know, Ezra Miller's Flash were, like, weren't staying on, right? After all, you do have other actors staying on, like uh, Shola Madueña's Blue Beetle, and obviously the Peacemaker crew, so it, it could have been the case. Um, to me, Aquaman's always felt like an obvious one for Lobo. I think right now what's being said is just like, oh, you know, they're not basically going to say it until kind of Aquaman 2's release is kind of you know, in the past quite a bit. Um, but yeah, ultimately, guys, basically hard reboot. The main characters, the main universe has got a whole new continuity. As you say, though, with the cameos at the end of Peacemaker, that's never, ever really been an issue for me because a lot of people get confused by that one. And 
you know, maybe I'm wrong, but like the way I see them addressing that with Peacemaker Season 2, and James Gunn did confirm it would be addressed, is some people say in their confusion, um, does this mean Peacemaker Season 1 isn't canon? It's like, well, no, like think about like the comics. It's slight, it's a very slight retcon because you can still have Peacemaker Season 1. You can still have practically all of the events that happen in there. You can have the butterfly invasion, so the alien invasion, and everything more or less goes down the way it went down. It's just that when they're walking on the field at the end when Peacemaker is carrying Harcourt as she's injured in that moment you just don't have the Justice League show up it's just a retcon do you know what I mean um, and as you said yeah like Shazam logic there's like a flashback scene if they wanted to show like very clearly in this they can just show the empty field in the recap that is one really easy way of doing it without making it you know, so in your face because normally new seasons do say the thing like previously on Peacemaker and in that field scene, they could just show them walking and nobody's even there. Do you know what I mean? Simple as that. There's nothing else in Peacemaker that would contradict uh, it being in the DCU. So yeah, th that really does make sense. And um, I think people are getting more used to it now. And maybe there has been a bit more confidence as you went on to say that with major reports stating, and I do want to say just like to be mega, mega, mega clear, Gunn hasn't outright said that Gal Gadot isn't Wonder Woman and that Ezra Miller is not Flash. It has been major trades who have reported that. But the thing is, he would normally say, especially if it wasn't true. So I, that's why a lot of us by now are very much so comfortable in assuming that yeah basically obviously Henry Cavill's not coming back <laughs> obviously we've got David Corrin where obviously Ben Affleck isn't the new Bruce Wayne Gunn has confirmed it's a new actor but as for Wonder Woman as for F Ezra Miller's Flash it does seem kind of obvious if you know what I mean that they're kind of not going there and as for Aquaman well it's kind of obvious after Momoa's insanely insanely blatant teases about him having a home at Warner Brothers and tagging the video with his screen DC and he's so excited but he can't say anything yet the Lobo teases James Gunn literally teasing Lobo himself after he came in as co-head of DC Studios yeah he's Lobo but I'd love to know if you guys feel or felt a similar way to Mr. Movie Mafia there and let me know what you thought about what I said in response and of course everything in this whopping massively freaking huge DCU discussion series video. I wanted to make it quite a big one. I mean, they're always pretty big, but this one is some content over the Christmas period uh, where I might not be uploading as much. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. There's been so much to discuss and I really enjoyed making this one because um, despite mixed feelings about the Arkham series switch up, there's still so much excitement to be had with the speculation going into that and, you know, just everything else that uh, we're talking about with the DCU. So let me know any and all thoughts down in the comments below if you made it this far we're gonna do a bit of a keyword to prove it so leave with whatever comment you're gonna comment down in that comment section hashtag christmas with the joker why not a little bit of a tribute there subscribe to the channel if if you're somehow not subscribed but until next time ladies and gentlemen just hope you have a lovely christmas whenever this is going up hope you have a lovely new year i might be back before the new year we'll, we'll have to wait and see thank you so much for watching i hope you have a lovely rest of your day and i'll see you people of the dcu in the next video goodbye